Welcome back fellow classic comic collectors. As always, I'm Scott Harris King and in this special episode I wanted to talk about my journey in becoming a comic book creator. Now, like a lot of comic fans, I've always dreamt of making my own comics. I'm sure a lot of you out there watching this have always wanted to make your own comics, and for one reason or another, most of you probably have never done it. I was in the same boat ever since I was a little kid. I wanted to make my own comics, but a couple years ago, after decades of loving comics but never really feeling like I could do it myself, I finally just decided to go ahead and do it, and I, the result is my comic, The Crime Busters. This is the first issue. The second issue is actually supposed to be arriving from the printer tomorrow. So I thought this would be a great time for me to give my experiences in creating my own comics and maybe help some of you learn about what actually goes into doing it and maybe overcome some of the mental blocks that you have. So over the course of this video, I'm first going to talk a little bit about my journey from comic reader and collector to comic creator, the different things that I went through in order to get to that point and what eventually made me decide to go ahead and go for it. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual process of making the comic, the tools that I use, the challenges that I face, things that I've learned as I was working on the comic, what went into selling the comic online, how I got the comic printed. I'm going to go into all the detail about that stuff because I know people are really curious about how that all works. And then finally, at the end of the video, again, I'm going to have um, tomorrow my second issue is supposed to arrive. So I'm going to do an unboxing of that second issue and I'm going to show you all the different variant covers for both issue one and two so you can see exactly what I've been doing and what the final product looks like. So. I hope you find this interesting. I know as a when I was deciding whether or not to finally get into making my own comics, I went on YouTube and I watched videos from other people that had made their own comics. I found it very helpful. So I thought I'd give a little bit back by sharing my experiences as a new comic creator. And I also just want to mention that uh, this is a very long video. I go into a lot of detail. So down below uh, I have added a section with some links to specific things. So if you want to jump to certain topics of interest, I have um, it broken down by the topics with the time codes. And I also have certain lessons that I've learned, uh, little nuggets of wisdom that I'm trying to impart uh, that hopefully will be helpful to you. And so I've broken those down in time codes as well. So, uh, you know, if you don't have time to watch the whole thing or there's specific things that are of interest to you, you know, of course, feel free to, to jump ahead. Hopefully that will, will help some of you. So I started reading comics in 1984 and I immediately fell in love. Like first time I bought a comic book, I went home and I made a checklist. I knew that I was going to be collecting comics for the rest of my life. I was going to read comics. I love comics. I, anytime I could get a comic, I would buy any comic I could find. I would read it. I'd study it. I just wanted to understand what the magic was in the comics. So very early on, in my comics experience as uh, a boy of 11 or 12, I knew that I wanted to make comics. And pretty soon I started uh, trying to do that. Now I'm, I, nowadays I am a professional writer. I write professionally. I always wanted to write my own stories. At that time I was also really into drawing as a kid. Um, and you can see here, here's a, here's a full splash page of the Avengers that I did sometime around uh, 1988 or 89, the story takes place on Hydro Base, so it very firmly sort of uh, identifies exactly when this story was taking place. This is the splash of a, a full issue that I tried to do myself. Um, I did full pencils for the first seven pages, and I have layouts for pages 8 to 14, and I, but I never actually finished the entire comic or added the word balloons, but I, I had the whole thing laid out. Um, I did stuff like... Um, I had a cover that I did. Um, here's here's the next page um, of Wonder Man uh, breaking out of this tube and um, Spider Man catching him. This is the thing where Wonder Man was basically giving his brain patterns back to Vision because I hated the whole like robot Vision version they were doing at the time. But anyway. Um, at this time in the late 80s, I actually started sending stories into Marvel uh, to try and get get them bought so I could start writing. I was very much inspired at the time by Jim Shooter, who was the editor-in-chief 
at Marvel Comics and I had known from reading stuff that he had written in the Overstreet Price Guide. I was aware of the fact that he had started writing Legion of Superheroes when he was 13. So I thought, hey, if Jim Shooter can start being a professional comic writer at 13, why not me? That didn't quite work out. I got um, a couple times. Marvel actually sent me a very polite uh, rejection letter, um, but I, you know, I kept at it. And eventually I um, got more into drawing. The school I went to didn't have any art classes, so it was all just copying comic books. I didn't have any sort of training. But after my senior year of high school and before my freshman year of college, um, the artist Paul Ryan, who was one of the big names at that time at Marvel, uh, actually lived in the area and he was teaching a night class on how to draw comics. And so I went to that class and I did uh, have the great fortune of receiving several weeks of uh, hands-on training and drawing comics from Paul Ryan. Even at that time, I told him I mainly wanted to be a writer. And he was very supportive. He thought it was great that I was taking the class because I wanted to understand how visual storytelling works and what my artists would be doing. I did, you know, hope that my art would be good enough. And what I learned there was actually kind of the wrong lesson because I just could not master the three-point perspective. I had never even worked with one-point perspective, much less three-point perspective. And so all these like cityscapes with these cool perspectives, I just couldn't get it. Um, I had a lot of positive feedback from him in terms of my my storytelling. There were exercises where he'd give us a, one of um, Tom DeFalco's Fantastic Four scripts that he was working on at the time, for instance, and he'd have us come up with our own page layouts in the Marvel method. And some of my page layouts were almost exactly the same as what Paul Ryan himself came up with. But then when it came time to draw them, I just couldn't do it. Uh, it was, and so... The lesson that I learned there, again, is, was the wrong lesson. It was that I felt like because I couldn't draw in the style of the big two and I, you know, couldn't match the, you know, most technically proficient professionals at Marvel and DC at the time, that I wasn't good enough at art to do comics. I've since learned that's not true because that's one very, very specific style of comics there's all sorts of other styles of drawing comics that are perfectly valid, but do not conform to the, the restrictions and dictates of the big two. So that's the first big lesson that I have now learned. It took me a long time to understand that I had taken the wrong lesson away from that. But in retrospect, a big lesson that, that I wanna help you guys learn is that there's no one right or wrong way to do comics. There's no right or wrong way to draw. You can have a style that's not the same as John Byrne, and you can have a style that's, you know, not the same as Art Spiegelman. You can come up with your own style, and it's perfectly valid. Now, there's lots of storytelling and comic book um, tricks and stuff that you can learn. Like, there are some rules that you can learn about how to do better storytelling, but there's no, like, wrong way to make comics. The only wrong way to make comics is to not make comics at all. But anyway, at the time I was discouraged, I decided to give up on drawing. I did become an art minor in college, so I did get some more formal training in drawing and in photography, um, and, and that helped me very much in terms of visualizing angles and perspectives and stuff when I was laying things out. But I decided to focus full time on being being a writer. You know, I got my degree in English. And at one point in the late 90s, I did submit several stories to Vertigo and to Marvel. And I did get some um, positive reinforcement. Uh, at one point, I had submitted this story for an updated version of the Haunted Tank that would take place during the Vietnam War. And uh, there was some sort of commentary on civil rights and, and stuff like that. And um, I got some positive feedback from the editors I was talking to at Vertigo. I did a couple drafts for them. But again, it was, it was less um, that the story wasn't good enough and more that I just didn't have the confidence. Uh, when, you know, I kind of let those relationships lapse when I didn't hear back, I didn't pursue things. I just took it as, well, it must not be good enough. And again, this is this is the wrong lesson to take away. This is all in my head. I was actually getting very good feedback from some of the top editors. And I feel now that if I'd continued to pursue that, you know, things might have di been different. Maybe I would have been published uh, by some of the big companies back at the time. But who knows? Um, the point is, I decided at that time that 
uh, to sort of change focus in my life. And I sort of gave up on the dream of being a professional comic book writer. It just seemed like too big of a hurdle to break in. Um, but I always wanted to make comics and, you know, I considered the idea of doing sort of my own self-published comics and the, it just seemed like the, the barrier to do that seemed way too high. But things started to change with the advent of digital comics and around 2009 I became very interested in a thing that was going on online, online that DC was doing called Zuda. It was this competition where you could submit eight page stories to DC and then they do this thing where they run 10 of them against each other for a month. Readers would vote on which ones they liked the best and then whichever one won would get a deal with DC to um, then continue that story. Zuda ran for about three years before it sort of petered out, but it was sort of um, a look for me into other opportunities to sort of break into the industry and get into it in a different way through um, digital comics. Now, digital comics have been around for several years at that point, but it was an area that I just never got into. Through Zuda, I met some people uh, and I started planning sort of an idea, planted a seed in my head for my own comic which would eventually become, again, the Crime Busters. Around this time, I had started really getting into boy comics, which is a Golden Age series, and I fell in love with the character of Crime Buster here, who's, the, again, from the, from the series Boy Comics. He's a Golden Age character, and since he's now in the public domain, I decided, okay, I can use this character and update him in the modern time. So I planned out this storyline where it would be kind of like... Um, the movie Brick, if you've ever seen that. That's a film noir that takes place in a high school. And so I thought, uh, and I had just seen that. It had come out a couple years ago. I really liked it. And I thought it was sort of a, a perfect opportunity to take Crime Buster, who's uh, in a lot of his stories, he's a high school age kid. And he gets involved in these very um, crime noir sort of uh, true crime storylines. And I thought, well, we can do something with that character in the style of Brick. Um, but Again, I didn't feel confident drawing myself. I didn't know any artists. I felt like, oh, you know, how am I supposed to meet artists? I looked around online. It was, there's just so many barriers in my mind to doing it. And so I ended up not doing that and then Zuda shut down. But I kept it in my head and I kept percolating and the idea kept um, simmering. And finally, in 2014, I decided, you know what? My art's not great, but, and I haven't drawn anything at this point in like, 15 years, but I thought, you know, why not, why not just try and, and do my own comic, maybe just do it digitally online, I don't know. So I started doing um, a, a version of Crime Buster, continuing the series. The last issue of Boy Comics was 119, I decided to just basically sort of reboot it, start with issue 120, I did like a soft reboot in the story, which has him arriving at college for the first day, and I had this very dark grim and gritty uh, crime noir inspired murder mystery where there was like a cult that was like murdering cheerleaders and people on the football team and I started drawing that and it became very labor intensive um, because I was trying to get this sort of noirish style. I, I wanted things to be very detailed and I was using a lot of photo references and I got really bogged down. And after I finished one page, I got a second page partially completed. I have layouts for pages like three and four that are done. And it just got bogged down. And again, I sort of stopped. And this is a big lesson that I want to, to pass on. Something that I actually learned when I was a kid. One of the best lessons in writing that I ever learned was from the author Piers Anthony, who's well known for you know his Xanth series. He's not a very well respected writer. Um, he's he's has a lot of mass popularity, but the critics sort of look down on his work. As a kid, I, I liked his work. As an adult, I understand the criticism. But the important thing is, he was a huge influence for me uh, because even as a kid, I realized that he was a professional. He would write these long author's notes we talk about the process and he was someone who he was writing these books not as some sort of art exercise but because he needed the money for his family and so he would churn them out he had a, a formula for writing and he was writing four novels a year for decades and 
in one of his columns, he talked about um, the idea of writer's block. And he said that he never gets writer's block because he has multiple projects going at the same time. And when one of them gets stuck, he just moves on to another one. And this was a huge lesson for me that, and this is, this applies for me as a writer, maybe not for everyone, but I think for a lot of people, you'll find that if you're experiencing writer's block, it's a lot of times it's not you as a writer or a creator that's blocked. It's the material that's blocked. I've, I've had this happen many times in my creative endeavors where I get to a certain point and it just gets bogged down and stuck. And, but I'm able to work on other things just fine. And that always tells me that there's something wrong with the material. Something is, sometimes I can identify what is, sometimes I can't, but my subconscious knows that something's not working. And so I've got to stop and sometimes I can figure it out. Sometimes I have to let my subconscious work through it. And then when I return to it in, you know, a week later or a couple of days later, it's something clicks as soon as I see it. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do this differently. But it was the material. It's the material that's blocked. And that's what happened with me in 2014. It took me a long time to sort of work through why I got bogged down and stopped on that. And the big reason was that it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. I'm not a dark, grim and gritty crime noir person. That's not the kind of story I liked. I was trying to do that to be true to that aspect of the original character in the original series, but it's not actually the aspect of that character or the series that I liked the most. What I really liked about the character was that basically he was like a teen detective. He was like uh, a Nancy Drew or a Hardy Boys sort of figure. And at the end of the series, that's what the series sort of became. It was him at school and he'd have these sort of romantic, these adventures where he'd, you know, go to Spain and do bullfighting and he'd like track down this mystery ring or his plane would crash in the Amazon. They were sort of these like boys adventure, teen adventure, teen detective sort of stories. That's what I liked. It's not the grim and gritty. It's not the dark murder stuff. So at some point I realized that it wasn't me that was blocked so much as the material because it wasn't what I wanted to do. And this is a big thing as a creator. If, you, if you're going to make your own thing that you got to know is you have to know yourself. You have to know what you like, what you want, what you really want to do. You have to understand what the story is about. It's not just uh, enough to like be like, I, I want to do a story where these two people fight. Why? Like, what's important about it? What about that story makes you want to do it? What What is the story about for you? And if you have something that you're passionate about, it's much less likely that you're going to get stuck on it if you know why you like it. Once I figured out um, what I really wanted to do, which was fun adventure stories with like a supernatural element and the one thing i really don't like about the noir genre is because is that there's a lot of violence towards women and and i really don't like that and i didn't want to be writing it i don't want to be perpetrating that it just made me feel bad to be doing it and so i wanted to have a story where uh, with a, a positive female um lead character so basically I reimagined my story. I gave, um, I had already come up with the idea of having, giving Crime Buster a um, female sidekick, but instead what I did was I expanded that character. I did a lot of character work so that she's not a sidekick, she's a full partner. And the other big thing that, that I did is I realized that art style wasn't really what I liked to do. It didn't suit my strengths. It made it very time consuming and very stiff and formal looking. What I really liked is cartooning. I liked Archie comics. I liked, you know, um, Life with Archie is a big influence for me because that's there's the original series is these uh, mystery adventure stories, but they're drawn in the classic Archie style and it works perfectly fine. So once I realized, you know, I don't have to draw Grim and Gritty. I don't have to write Grim and Gritty. I can draw the way I like to draw and the way I, the kind of drawings I like to see, and I can write the stories that I want to write then things really kind of unlocked for me. So in 2018, I had this sort of seminal moment where um, I was thinking about my life. I had recently, in two, at the end of 2017, I moved in with um, my wife at that time. Um, she was my girlfriend. And I was thinking about my life. You know, I had 
I was in my 40s, um, which I still am, but I was in my 40s now and I was just sort of taking stock of things. And I realized that, you know, I had three big dreams growing up, the three things that I wanted to do with my life. And those three things were I wanted to travel the world. And I've been lucky enough to do that. I've been to, I think I've been to um, four continents. I, and I've been to something like 25 different countries. I've traveled extensively around the world. And it's wonderful. And I love it. And, and I've been blessed to have the opportunity to do that. I also wanted to find true love and I've been incredibly fortunate to meet my wife and uh, you know I am a softie I do collect romance comics so sorry to get sappy but um, that was a dream that had come true as well but the third thing that I wanted to do in my life the three things I wanted to do the only one that I hadn't actually done was make comic books and so at the beginning of 2018 I said you know what it doesn't matter if my art is professional level. It doesn't matter if my art looks like Marvel or DC art. I know I'm a good writer and I understand comics. I understand storytelling and I can draw at least well enough to tell the story that I want to tell. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And this is another big lesson I want to share with you, which is basically the only thing that's keeping you from doing comics is not doing comics. There's, there's literally no barrier now to making comics. You can, anyone can make comics. The only thing that you really need to do is to do it. And uh, in the next part of the video, and this went a little bit longer, like all of my videos than, than I meant it to, but in the next part of my video, I'm gonna talk now about what exactly went into making the comic. So when I started working on the first issue of the Crime Busters, it had been percolating in my head for a number of years as I just went over. So there were certain things about the characters that I had already worked out. I'd done a lot of character work on Chuck Chandler himself. That's the lead character, Crime Buster. Um, and I'd also done a lot of work on his new partner, Trixie Trouble. Um, and so I, I worked very hard on both of those characters, particularly Trixie, to figure out who they were, what their relationship was with each other, how they worked together. Um, it was an interesting exercise because I was coming from a place where I had an established character with established character traits. And so I needed, there were certain things that he brought to the table, but there's certain things he didn't bring to the table that I wanted to make sure Trixie did as a counterpoint. I wanted to have her have certain personality traits that would enhance the story. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from various things. Life with Archie was a big one, but also, um, you know, Skulder and Molly and the X-Files is another uh, big influence. Um, Unbeatable Squirrel Girl was a big influence for me on some of the supporting characters. So I took a lot of these influences and spent a lot of time thinking about things. When it came time to actually uh, work on the comic, it took me quite a long time to um, lay out the first issue. It, it took me several months. Uh, I would have periods where I would um, work through things pretty quickly and then other times where it would really bog down. Part of that was just not being in comic book shape. Like it had been so long since I had thought like this that it was just hard to sort of get those muscles working. And what I did was I had the basic story. Um, I did a layout with uh, or a, an outline where I wrote down what was going to happen. I broke that sort of down into different sections. Now I've done some work um, in screenwriting um, a little bit, N nothing that you would have ever heard of, but I did a little work, but basically as a script doctor, where I got paid to go in and do some things. And during that brief um, phase of my career as a writer, I learned a lot about story structure. So I thought about the first issue as a self-contained story, beginning, middle, end, and I tried to hit all the beats that you would hit from a classic movie beat sheet. And so I broke the story down like that. And then the most time consuming part for me at that point, it's much faster for me now, was that I, would, I went page by page and I did thumbnails. Now, at the time, I was actually drawing these thumbnails all by hand in a notebook. So, so here's a couple example pages. One of the reasons this was took me the longest in this first issue is like the most important really for me part of making the comic was the layout process because I realized pretty quickly that in order to understand what the panel layout was going to be and and what um, 
the people were going to be, what angles I was taking, what the people would be doing in each panel. I needed to also know what they were doing in each panel. And I needed, I basically had to write out what the dialogue was going to be, the just the gist. Like in this panel, they're talking about X. In this panel, they're talking about Y. And so a lot of the writing in the comic was done during this phase. I had, again, the basic sort of um, overview of the comic, but the writing uh, was really done during the layout section. As I was breaking down what each page was going to look like and setting up the panels, um, I would be writing little snippets of dialogue. Um, my first couple pages, I actually were doing them really small, but as I started going through the dialogue, I had to expand it to a full page. This process took me several months to do this for one issue. I would try and do one page a night before bed, but sometimes they would get really complicated and I'd have to think things through or let my subconscious think things through when they get stuck. So it took me several months to get through this process. Now, in contrast to that, I'm currently working on issue three and I'm doing the same thing. And the process of breaking these pages out uh, and laying out the whole story took me about one month and I could have done it much faster. I'm at the point now where most pages I can actually lay out in 15 to 20 minutes as opposed to some of these taking me like a week. Um, it's just gotten much faster. I don't have to do nearly as much writing out of specific dialogue. There's certain points where I still do that. And, but they're mainly notes to myself. So when I get back to the point where I'm drawing that page, I'll have that. Um, so I did that. And then the next step, this was in um, October of um, 2018. The next step was I had to actually get the programs that I needed on my computer to actually do this. Now, I do know people that, that do comics classic old school style they have you know the 11 by 17 pages they pencil on the pages and then they actually ink it and then they have like a giant scanner and they scan that in and that's totally cool i love the old school production for me personally it's much much easier to do everything digitally on the computer particularly because there's certain um, programs and stuff that you can use so i guess this is another big lesson i want to share is that um, you need to find the tools that work for you in terms of creating comics because what works for one person isn't going to work for someone else you may find that trying to create a comic one way is just terrible for you but then if you try a different way to do it it might suddenly click and become super easy so for me it's much easier to do things digitally now when i tried my um short-lived attempt in 2014 i had purchased at that time i had a a little drawing tablet and it came with Manga Studio 4 but I had lost the tablet at some point and I have now had a different computer it didn't have the software on so basically I bought the newer version of that same thing so what I have now is this simple Wacom tablet it comes with this little pen you can program these to do different things I'm just too old to figure that out I think so for me it's just basically it's a pen it did take a while to get used to um, looking at the screen while you're drawing down here, because normally when you're drawing, you're looking at what you're drawing. When you when and you can get more expensive tablets where you can draw on it, but for the less expensive models like this, you know, you basically the tablets down here and the monitor is up here, so you have to look up. It took me a little while to get used to that, but now it's second nature. I don't even notice that it's happening. So it, it's, it wasn't actually that big of a deal. This tablet, when that time I bought it, it was $99 for the tablet. It also came with the program, which is called Clip Studio Paint, AKA Manga Studio 5. This is a program that's a lot like Photoshop, but it's specifically designed for you to make comics. So it has all these tools where you can make word balloons and you can do um, make uh, panels and do all this stuff. All the tools are in there. It also comes with a bunch of preloaded manga tools. So like if you want to have speed lines and blurring effects, it can do all that stuff all preloaded. Um, it is designed for manga. So some of the stuff is like vertically instead of horizontal because the 
stuff like that. But it's all it's all ma made for comics, and for me, it makes things so much easier. There's a places online where you can also download different fonts. There's a place called Blambot. It's a great place, and uh, so you can get all of these fonts that are specifically designed to look like comic books, different old school comic fonts, so you can make your comic look like a, a comic book. So basically that's what I did next. Once I had everything laid out at the beginning of October in uh, 2018, I got my new tablet, I got um, Clip Studio Paint, aka Manga Studio 5, set up on my computer, and then I went through the process of taking these um, and then taking those thumbnails and actually making the pages. Now again, this is all something that took me a month to do. I was doing one page a day, basically taking what I had there, breaking it out, and I was learning how to use the program. And then I was basically having to re-sketch all of the thing. I could have scanned this, but what I did was I basically just, once I had the panel breakdown, I re-sketched all of the thumbnails. So that took me a month. Again, I do this all at once now. So I do the thumbnails and the page breakdown all at the same time. And it took me a month to do the entire comic from scratch. So now I have the whole third issue laid out, all the panel layouts, all the where people are, are what they're saying, what they're doing for the whole book. And the next step for me with that issue is going to be to just go over and actually draw it for real. Um, but when I was working on the first issue, there was another intermediate phase, which was great. And here's the lesson is like to see what other people are doing, take inspiration from other people's work. Again, I was insecure about my art and, um, I always had this, I was like, well, I'm going to do this as best I can, but I'm not very good. And I went to this convention called MICE, MICE 2018. MICE stands for Massachusetts Independent Comics Expo, and it's an annual convention that is in, held in Cambridge at Lesley University, just outside of Boston, um, by the Porter Tea Stop. And what it is, is, is a show that's just for independent creators, people who make their own comic books. And so I went there, and I got a bunch of comics. I've, I've got a handful of them here, but I, I got a whole bunch of different comics at MICE. Um... Like uh, this one is from the Boston Comics Roundtable, which is a collective of independent comic creators who share work with each other and give each other support and feedback and stuff. And they, they do these anthologies. Um, this is one I got actually from my 2019. And um, here's a local guy who's done a bunch of comics, Pyramid Nights. I got a whole bunch of these. I've got like 40 or 50 of these at this point. And they're... Other people just like me, just like you, who are just love comics and they make their comics. And I was so inspired by getting these comics. Some of them were really great. There are some comics that I've gotten at these shows that are, you know, just as good as anything that's being put up on Marvel and DC. Um, some of them weren't very good. Some of them were crudely drawn. Some of them had very weird writing uh, strange storytelling that just made it hard, confusing to find. But you know what? I loved all of them because these are people who just have a huge passion for comics to the point where they're driven to spend their free time because most of them are not professionals. They're doing this as a hobby like I am. But they're driven to spend their time making comics and, you know, bringing their dreams to life. And the way you do get better is by doing it. And so from someone who is insecure about doing comics, like maybe you are seeing people overcome that and just put themselves out there and put their work out there and basically say, this might not be great. You know, maybe this isn't Neil Adams. Uh, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not professional level, but I love it doing it and I want to share my work and I want to share my stories. And so they just, they just do it. They just do it. So that was a huge inspiration for me. And again, a big lesson that I think we can take away is to just do it and then, and get inspiration from other people who are doing it. If there's something you want to do, look at the people who are doing it and see how they're doing it and why they're doing it and how they're able to do it and take take that inspiration because that's what I did and it made a huge difference when I came back from that show with my stack of comics you know one thing I was doing was I was doing research on printers I would try to buy comics from that were samples from all these different 
printing companies. So that was, that was, you know, useful research, but much more useful was just the inspiration that I got. And when I got back from that show, I was like, let's do this. Yeah. Um, and then it took me like six months to do it. And that's because it's just learning the new software, just teaching myself how to draw in a new style or how to remembering how to draw at all for me and, and doing it after work. So like I get done with work at five o'clock and then, you know, my wife at that point, still my girlfriend, her train gets home for at seven. So I'd have this two hour window each night between my work and her getting home where I would draw like half a page a day. So it was like over two months because the comics 34 first issue is 34 pages of comic art um, to do the pencils. And then once the pencils were done, I went back in and I did all the inking and all the shading. Mine's in grayscale. It's a black and white comic. Um, so like here, here's a two page spread. You can see the, the grayscales. Um, I'm colorblind. That's one reason. Um, it's something where it would have taken me an extra month or two months per issue to try and figure out the coloring because I'm colorblind and it, it would also cost significantly more to print in color. So for several reasons, I decided to just do it in grayscale with the idea that at some point, if I collect my issues into a trade, then at that point I can pay someone to have it colorized. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I did that and then I went through and I added all the text, the word balloons, and um, that it, the whole process, basically, I started laying out the pages in Clip Studio Paint at the beginning of October, October 1st, 2018. Um, I finished the comic um, the second week of May. And so, you know, it took a long time. It took a long time to be doing it, you know, and I had people that were reading the drafts and giving me feedback and then I'd make corrections and it was a ton of work, but uh, it was so fulfilling. And to have finally get the comic, this is a, this is actually the proof copy that I got from the printer to when I finally got this in the mail. Um, it was just one of the most fulfilling moments of my life to hold my comic in my hand for the first time. Um, but there was, that was only part of the job. So making the comic was part of the job, getting the comic into people's hands, getting it printed and distributing it and paying for it and all that stuff is a whole separate part of the process, which, I'm, which I'll go over for you right now. So there's a lot of decisions that you'll need to make when you decide to make a comic involving the scale that you want to do it at, what, what you want to do long term um these are the things you should should think about you don't you know the important thing is to work on the comic that's number one um but i decided to that at some point when i'm older i would love to build this up big enough where i can actually do it full time it's not something that i can do anytime soon and i have a great job I love my coworkers. I love my job. So I, I'm not really looking to like leave my job. That's not, that's not where I'm coming from, but I love making comics. And so every time I'm working on comics, I'm like, I wish I could do this eight hours a day instead of two hours a day. And so I decided to, to not cut any corners and try and build things from the ground up. There's a number of things that I did that you don't have to do um, when you're making a comic but I decided to do them right from the start and it involves outlaying significantly more money again than you, than you strictly have to do bare bones. You can just draw, you know, on the computer, um, on whatever program comes in your computer and you can distribute it digitally and you won't have to spend anything, but I love print comics. I'm old school. I want to hold that comic in my hand. I'm also a collector. I, and one of the big things for me was I still wanted to have that Boy Comics 120, the continuation of Chuck's series from the Golden Age. I wanted to have that Boy Comics 120 in my hand. And so I could put it in my collection right behind issue 119 and continue that series. So for me, I always wanted to have the physical comics. So what I did is... Um, there's several like ground level 
organizational decisions I decided to make. I got my own domain name. It's crimebustercomics.com, and that cost me a certain amount up front. I think it was like $120 for a three-year plan, and then I pay a certain amount every year to host it. Um, so I wanted to have my own website that I can direct people to. I can include like files and samples and uh, I can post news updates, although I haven't been doing that that much on there because the other big thing that I learned is that you want to have a mailing list. And so instead of just posting my like blog entries on my website where no one's reading it, I started collecting people, interested party, people who are interested in the comic, I started getting their emails and I started sending out a monthly newsletter that held out all that information. And you can get that for free, like on something like MailChimp, but if you get to a certain size, then you have to start paying. I'm not quite to that, not even close to that level yet. But I also did um, some things like if you, if you do a mailing list, you're required to give them a physical address that then becomes public record. I didn't want to give my home address for that. So I ended up paying $65 to get annually to get a post office box. Again, you don't have to do that. That's just something I did for privacy sake. Um, so I did that. It was an initial outlay of cost. I also wanted to do things right in terms of filing for copyright. Um, copyright laws are interesting, but I wanted to officially file my story with copyright. That's $55 per issue to do the copyright. Um, I also wanted to get a trademark on the series title, The Crime Busters. Most people, and I want to stress, like, it sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but it's also not something that you have to do. I think most people that, you know, go through Kickstarter or go to these shows and just make their own comics, most of them don't do any of this stuff. But I've chosen to do it because I'm trying to build a sustainable thing. And so I wanted to make sure that I have the trademark for Crime Busters. And I do. Uh, it cost me $350 with the government to register that trademark, but I do have it. Um, the Crime Busters, the logo, um, this title's trademarked. I particularly wanted to do that because there is a group of characters called the Crime Busters in the DC universe. They've never had their own series, so they've never been under trademark, but I, it's not that I care about anyone else actually using it. I'm just protecting myself in case someone tries to come after me to tell me not to use it. I want to have that at least a little bit of legal protection. So again, most people don't do that. Um, but uh, that's an outlay of money that I decided was worth it for me to sort of go do things by the book. Um, huge thing for me in terms of thinking about distribution and about publishing and all of this stuff was I mentioned earlier that I met some people through that Zuda thing. Well, the big thing person that I met was a guy named Tyler James. He has a, at this time, at, back then he was at the point where I am now. He was just making his own comics for the love of comics and he wanted to make it bigger. Now he actually does comics as a full-time career. He has a, an imprint called Comics Tribe that has diamond distribution when that exists again. And most importantly, though, he runs this thing called the Comics Launch, which is a community where he teaches people how to use um, platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo to get crowdfunding for comics. And I learned a ton of stuff from that podcast, and eventually I signed up to join that program. And I decided to go do my main distribution through Kickstarter. Here's a, a big big important lesson that I want to share and that is that anybody can make comics now because technology and the internet have democratized the comic making progress. There's no longer gatekeepers. Back in the 1980s there was a huge boom of, in, of indie books when the, when the first um, comic stores opened and that's because all of a sudden all of the people who couldn't get national distribution deals through newsstands because that was very difficult to do, now they could suddenly distribute books directly to comic stores. And so there was this huge boom of all these indie creators and new publishing companies. Well, we're seeing the same thing now, but it's through digital distribution. And now we're at the point where you don't have to go through the comic stores because you can get an audience online and you can 
sell them the comics online and deliver the comics directly to them and completely bypass the entire structure of the comics industry. So thanks to the internet, there's nobody anymore that's telling you you can't make comics or you can't sell comics or you can't distribute comics. It, everyone has the opportunity to find their fans and not just from people that are in your area hitting your comic store. Now you can find fans across the entire world and you can get the books directly in their hand. And I've chosen to do that mainly through Kickstarter and to a lesser degree through my website and through my mailing list. Um, but I decided to sort of focus on Kickstarter as my distribution system. Um, I ended up pricing my comic a little bit higher than you would see at a, at a comic stand. And there's a couple reasons. Part of that is to cover the costs. Part of it is a Kickstarter mentality because um, I've learned that like if you like a project, if people like a project on Kickstarter, they're going to back it for $10 just as often as they're going to back it for $5. Like a couple extra dollars doesn't really matter, doesn't factor into most people's decisions in the same way that it would at a, at a local comic shop. When you go to a local comic shop, there's a mentality there that what you're seeing is disposable entertainment. You, you're trained to think of comics as being as being a mass produced thing that you read quickly and forget quickly. And so it needs to be at a cheap price point. And so there's people are like, um, you know, if it's more than $4 cover price, even that's a crazy, you know, you want it to be three who would pay more for that. If you go to comic shows though, and you, and you're buying from independent creators and you think of it more like, um, like a curated experience. It's like, it's like the difference between um, getting, you know, a, a can of soup at the grocery store or going to your, you know, your local farm to table restaurant and getting a, a bowl of soup that's made there fresh for you. It's the same idea where it's a different mentality. People that go to Artist's Alley looking to buy comics are much more are willing to spend eight or ten dollars on a new comic because they know this person just spent you know months of their life doing it it's a whole different mindset so i knew going into this that i didn't have a sustainable model at present for a um a local comic shop comic store sort of mentality i knew that i had to embrace the indiness of my book and that also allowed me to price my book at a higher price point that makes it more sustainable. You know, um, another way to look at it is this. If I price this at $4, I'm likely to get a lot more people that will try it, right? But um, I would rather have half that many people spend twice as much money because the people that will spend that much money are the people that are going to be invested in the story, invested in me as a creator, and who will want to come back. You know, if you treat your comic as disposable, people will dispose of it. I guess this is another big lesson that I want to impart, is that you should value your own work. Um, there's this weird idea that art, it doesn't have a value. And, you know, it took me, again, eight months to do the first issue and so it was a lot of work you know and it was a lot of hard work and maybe it's not the most professional in some ways um but i think it's a really good story it's well written i think the art is serviceable and is in the head some parts that i think actually look kind of cool and um so you know for me it means a lot and i don't want to undervalue my own time and effort and also I don't want to undervalue my own work and I think that's something that a lot of creators do because even the people making the comics are in this local comic shop mindset where they're like comics are supposed to be four dollars so I have to price my comic at four dollars because that's what comic books are worth but that's not true that's not true the comic is is the, the value of the comic um is something that the readers really figure out for themselves. And I'm happy to say that, you know, when I did the Kickstarter for my second issue, almost everybody who backed the first campaign came back and bought the second issue. People liked it. And, um, you know, 
the difference between spending four dollars on a comic and eight dollars on a comic ultimately it's four bucks so most people if they like it they're gonna follow it and also you know because i'm only putting out two issues a year at this point it's not like it's a huge financial burden for people to follow it um so yeah those are just some of the things that went in my thought process and pricing and in, in using Kickstarter. But a lot of the things that I've learned and, and that mindset, that's a lesson that I learned from the Tyler James um, podcast. He had a whole episode that was talking about pricing and it really just opened my mind. And it made me think that I could do this because, you know, with this book, let's say that I sold it for $4 and I was making like, whatever, like a dollar per copy in order to have a, like a sustainable and get enough money to theoretically do this full time, I'd need to have you know, like 10,000 readers. Um, and that's just not, that's just not going to happen. Um, but at the higher price point, I need to have far, far fewer. So it's like, can I find 10,000 people to buy my comic? I don't know. Could I find 2000 people? I mean, that seems a lot more reasonable. So again, these are just some of the thoughts that I went through when I was figuring out what I was going to do, the pricing, the distribution, how this was going to work for me, the idea of making it into a business as opposed to a hobby. I'm not nearly at that point yet. I'm like underwater in terms of the cost for my comic, not by a lot. And again, I've shelled out a lot of um, costs that most people don't do or don't have to do. If I hadn't done those things, I would be about break even at this point. Um, but it's just some of the, some of the thinking and some of the lessons that I've learned. Um, so I went to Kickstarter last year, uh, last June, I did the Kickstarter, June, 2019, I did the Kickstarter for my first issue and it was successful. I set my goal at $500. Um, I ended up raising 1450. My actual costs was far more than 500. Uh, in fact, um, I ended up spending, so the 1450 is not what you actually get, first of all. Um, there's a cut from Kickstarter, there's a cut from the uh, credit card company, and so the amount I received was 1300 and the my costs for the comic were a little over a thousand. So I did end up making a profit. I ended up making about $250 uh, all told, plus I ended up with um, over a hundred copies of the first issue left to then sell at conventions and stuff. And so theoretically, you know, I could sell all those and, you know, make my money back. Um, that's more difficult than it sounds because when you go to those shows, you have to spend the money on the table fees. Um, going to a shows was a whole new thing for me. I'd never done it before. And there was a lot of startup costs with that. I bought a banner that was $150 to have behind my table to advertise, I had to get certain things like a tablecloth. I had to get, you know, various things that, that cost money. And then there's the fees themselves. The shows I've been to, the table fees so far have ranged anywhere from free, which was great. Um, but there, I was the only, there's only two people, two people tabling at the show. So it was about as small a show as you can think of. Up to, um, there was one show that was a whole weekend, a giant weekend show that I spent $200 on the table. And I only sold $85 worth of stuff. So there's like over $100 in the hole just for that experience. So that was a really good experience. It taught me a lot about what types of shows to go to, what types of shows not to go to. You have to find, uh, if you're doing books in this sort of arena like I am, finding shows kind of like mice that are where the people coming in are looking for that type of comic. You're going to be much more successful than if you're at a big show where the uh, focus is on merchandise or like celebrity signings because the people that go to those shows aren't going to buy stuff from Artist Alley. And so um, well, even when they go through Artist Alley, they just look at stuff and they don't stop. So that's been very instructive, but there's a lot of cost with that as well. Um, but l let me finish telling you about my Kickstarter experience and then I can talk some about uh, what my experience has been since that first Kickstarter and going into issue two. So once the Kickstarter was over, then I had to fulfill the stuff. And this is where printing came in. So printing is the thing I want to talk about a little bit. It's very important. And again, 
the, the big thing with the printing is it's another way in which the gatekeeping, the barriers that have kept people in the past from doing comics have disappeared. Up until, you know, the last 10 years or so when print-on-demand came into play, if you wanted to make a comic, you had to do what's called an offset print run, where they make these plates, it's like old-school printing, and because of the costs involved with that, you'd have to print like two, a minimum of like 2,000 copies most of the time with these offset printers. And so you'd have to have this big outlay of money up front in order to do anything. That's no longer the case. Thanks to print-on-demand, you can uh, just... As it says, you can just print like one copy at a time if you want to. And so there's not nearly that outlay of, of money. So when I was looking at printers um, with my, I had a successful Kickstarter, but even then I've still only sold, I think, 74 copies of my comic through the Kickstarter. So I didn't need or want to spend, you know, thousands of dollars getting this giant print run. I looked at a few different options. Um, one option that a lot of independent comic people like myself use is called Kablam. I think they're in Florida and they're a company that does print on demand. They can print any number of copies as low as a single issue. Um, their, their price per issue is a little, is slightly higher than some of the other options as a result. But one thing they have is they do have a cool thing um, where I haven't looked into this too much myself, but I've seen other people that do it. You can basically set up like your online store so that so if when someone wants to buy the comic the order goes to kablam they print the comic and then they mail it to the people so it's a literal print on demand what i decided to do is a little bit different i ended up going with an alternate company um called comics wellspring which is the division of greco printing they're in michigan and with them uh, basically they have a minimum order size of 25 copies. I was doing multiple variant covers, so it was a minimum of 25 copies per variant cover, but that ended up working out just about right with my orders for my various covers. And I ended up ordering about, uh, I think it was 212 or 213 total copies when everything, all the variants were combined. And, um, Again, since I was printing in black and white um, and grayscale, the cost was significantly cheaper for me. It was about a dollar less per issue. It still worked out to be slightly over $2. I think it was $2.12 per copy. Uh, that includes the shipping and everything. And that you have to include the shipping because it does cost quite a bit to ship these giant heavy cases of comics across the country. Now, if you're doing like an offset printing, you may be able to get copies much cheaper per copy. It may be 75 cents, 80 cents, or a dollar or something. But again, you have to buy them in bulk. So for me, I was able to get this order of these 212 copies fulfilled, like the 74 copies that I sold through the Kickstarter, had over 100 left for myself to then sell at shows. And the total outlay, including shipping, I think it was $455 or something like that. And um, I had raised more than that with Kickstarter, so I was able to cover all the costs of, of printing the comic right up front um, by getting the Kickstarter, which I basically use as, as pre-orders. Another thing to keep in mind when you're doing your printing and setting up your comic and getting ready to distribute it or, or publicize it I went through Kickstarter and a lot of people on Kickstarter, they'll go there and you're, you're paying to have the comic completed. So they might have like five or six pages done and then they need to raise the money to pay the artist to draw the rest. Since I was doing it myself, I didn't have to do it that way. And I decided it would be much less uh, stressful for me if I completed the book before I even went to Kickstarter. That also gains a lot more trust for the Kickstarter backers. Because they, you know, if, if you're paying for something where you might get it a year from now, but the artist hasn't even drawn it, there's a much more nebulous um, situation where things can happen. Things ha have happened and gone wrong and people haven't gotten their books. But when you have a book that's already complete and you're just raising the money to print it, uh, you're more likely to get people to to trust you and, and um, support you um, because you have sort of the proof of concept. And uh, so that's what I decided to do. And I was correct. It's much less stressful to do it that way. When I did the second issue, I got most of the way done and I announced when the Kickstarter was going to come out. 
and I still wasn't quite done when I started the Kickstarter. And then I had a bunch of life events that really interrupted me working on issue two. And so I had announced that I would be going to the printer at a certain time and I'd be getting the books at a certain time. I'd be mailing them out at a certain time. And I suddenly had these deadlines that I had to hit because I hadn't finished the comic when I thought I was going to. And it was very stressful. It led to a lot of work. So this is a, an important lesson to just keep in mind is to you know work at your own pace and for some people that might mean they do like a big burst of work like they just work and work because they have this huge like you know energy uh for me i find that that does happen occasionally but i'm more of, of a you know a bricklayer so i'll work an hour two hours a day each day over a period of several months and just put you know draw two panels if i can just only get two panels done in a day then i just do the two panels but slowly over time everything gets pieced together so figure out what works for you what's sustainable for you what your workflow is and that will inform the whole process including when you go to find readers and market the book um, sell the book and distribute the book it will in your work process and your workflow will help you determine basically all of those different things so that you're not stressed out and you're not promising things that you then have to try and deliver so you know figure out what actually works for you and then just stay within that i think that's that's a big thing it's another big lesson that i learned from writing novels i've written a couple novels they, they haven't been published at some point i might put them up on amazon or something but the, the important lesson is when people think about writing a novel, they're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to write a 300 page novel? It seems so big, but you don't have to write a 300 page novel because nobody can just sit down and write 300 pages in a row. You'll pass out and you'll probably die, but anybody can write one page, right? So all you really need to do to write a 300 page novel is write one page and then do it 300 times. So just, you know, if you, if it's, let's say going off topic a little in comics, but in terms of, say you want to write a novel and you've never done it, write one page before bed, carve out a half hour before bed and, and write a page. And then the next night do that. And at the end of a year, you're going to have a 350 page novel completed. For me, working on comics is the same way. I try and like lay out one page a day. And then when the layouts are done, I try and do the, the pencil, the line work for half a page a day. And then when that's done, I'll try and do the inking and the coloring for one page a day. And the writing that like the dialogue and the word balloons is a little bit faster. So I might try and do two pages a day when I'm at that point in the process, but I'm not trying to like do everything all at once. I'm trying to just stay within myself um, so that I don't get overworked and overstressed. So again, just, just look at it, um, in whatever way that works for you and just stay within that. And don't think of it as some huge thing that that's going to be so big. So, okay. So I, for me with Kickstarter, you know, the last phase, the process is I got the money to print the book. So I made the book, I got the money to print the book. And then I got the book printed. I had a couple hiccups. They weren't major. Um, it was just some communication and internal communication with them where I was really excited when I got the package and I went to film a, an unboxing video and partway through, I realized they had forgotten to send me two of the variant covers, like no copies of it at all. So I had to contact them and they sent them about two weeks later. Wasn't a big deal for the most part. I've been pretty happy with, um, with uh, Comics Wellspring. That's why I went with them because they have very good reviews in terms of their customer service. And everybody that I've worked with there has been really great. So um, for me, they've been good, but there are a lot of other options. You can research. There may, you know, if you want to like say support a local printer um, that might work for you. Uh, if, and if you, if there's a local printer where you can pick the comics up that may offset um, a higher cost for a printer if you can pick them up and you don't have to have all the shipping costs. You know, um, for me, shipping all of these books from Michigan added, you know, 50 
dollars to the first issue and with the second issue i have a much bigger print run and so it's like over a hundred dollars shipping if i was using a local printer the cost per issue um, may be higher but i might be able to get a cheaper overall thing if i just drive to the printer and just put the comics in the back of my car so that's something to look into there are a lot of options um available to you so i would just do some research and see what kind of printer is best for you some printers do offer in-house um, fulfillment as well. I mentioned with the print-on-demand at Kablam, they will mail the comic directly. Even with the larger sort of Kickstarter orders, some of the bigger printers will do uh, fulfillment for you. So when you get your order um, printed, you can send them the information for your Kickstarter backers and they will mail the comics out directly from there. I decided not to do that because I wanted to make sure that everything was fulfilled correctly. I had some bonus materials like trading cards and prints and stuff that some of the backers were getting. I wanted to make sure everything the the um, was collated correctly and everyone got the exact thing. And I felt like for me personally, uh, even though it was a lot more work for me, um, I wanted to just make sure that the end experience for my backers was perfect and no one like got the wrong thing or had anything to complain about and so but you know um there are people that have had those services and have been perfectly satisfied with them so that's again something to research if you go along these lines um so once i got them uh you know i had some shipping stuff i had to figure out there's there's like there's uh websites where you can get the get like discounted shipping um, and so I was able to go through some of those websites and print out the shipping labels right here in my house. I bought a scale so I could weigh the packages that I was sending out uh, to make sure I wasn't overpaying or underpaying because I didn't want anything returned to me. It took quite a while to do this. I did some sketch covers which took me a long time because I'm very slow with drawing things by hand but I do have like some blanks. I'll show you all of the different variants later when we get to that part of the video. Um, and, uh, so that was kind of the end of that process. And then I sort of, at that point I started going to comic shows. I had a lot to learn there. There's a lot with engagement. Um, it's, it, there's a fine line to walk between trying to engage people as they're going by your table without, um, annoying them. And so this is still something I'm working on. I think a lot of comic creators are more introverted, so we're not like natural, sort of hucksters to get people to come and look at our stuff there's other certain decisions that i personally decided to make a lot of people at comic shows in order to make back their table fees they will make prints um, of a bunch of popular characters that's technically copyright infringement but it shows people are usually you know pretty lax about this but so if you walk around a comic show you'll see like in Artist Alley, you might see like 40 tables and 15 of them will have prints of Deadpool or something, right? So that's how the people make their money back because the prints are much cheaper to do than comics. They're much faster to do than comics. And there are much, and you can sell them for more than the comics. So there's a much higher um, profit margin on selling prints. And so in order to get your table fees back, what a lot of smaller creators like myself will do is will they'll make a print of Deadpool, they'll make a print of Wolverine or whatever. They'll sell those for ten dollars or whatever and they only cost like a dollar to print or less. And then hopefully the idea is people will come to your table to buy those and then they'll see your comic and get those. I decided not to do that. I wanted everything at my table to be related to my comic because I'm trying to build a, a brand um, and um, that has certainly limited the amount of money that I'm bringing in. Uh, so there's tables, like I mentioned earlier, I lost over hundred dollars at one convention on my table fee. That's something where if I had done something like, you know, having a, a Deadpool print, then maybe I could have sold a few of those, but I would rather, um, be the only game in town and nobody else is going to have the crime buster prints or the crime buster comics. You have to come to me you want a Deadpool print there's going to be 30 different options um, and so I decided for me personally I was going to focus on my characters and do my own thing but that is something that everyone needs to sort of decide for themselves some people really enjoy drawing Boba Fett or, or you know 
the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. Some people really enjoy doing the Doctor Who stuff, and and um, if that's you, then that's great. That's another option for you. Uh, in order to sort of offset your your costs at a, at a convention, um, but the convention's interesting. It's also a good place to get. Um, people for your mailing list you know I always bring a sign up sheet for my mailing list I have trading cards with all the information about my comic and my website address my Instagram address and email address on the back of those cards so I can give those out to people so they can find me um, and again another thing that is time consuming and may or may not be for you but just again building the brand as um, the Gen Zers might say uh, I know everyone under the age of 25 is always building their brand. Well, there's there's a reason for that. And so I've got an Instagram feed. I've got a Twitter account. I've got a Facebook group. Um, and I'm not great with any of those. It doesn't come naturally to me. Um, so uh, I'm much more comfortable here on YouTube, for instance. So this is something where you need to find what works for you. I'm finding that I really much, much prefer YouTube to any of the other channels in terms of communicating and just sharing things with people. I love sharing my old comics on this channel. So um, those are all important and valuable sort of ways to, to broaden. Uh, but again, it's, there's a separate from actually making the comic is sort of you know marketing the comic and you don't have to do both if you don't want to you can make the comic and and just sell it for 20 pe to 20 people or whatever that's totally fine everyone has to just figure out for themselves what works for them and what they want to do and why again you have to know yourself why do you want to do it what's what are you getting out of it and what you're getting out of it will dictate and will tell you what you need to put into it as well so for me there's a lot that i want to get out of making comics so i'm having to put in a lot more stuff if you're looking to get less out of it then you don't have to put as much into it so that's the balance you just need to understand yourself and understand why you're doing it so again i've got issue two and uh the package is supposed to be delivered anytime now um, I do have the proof, but I'm not going to bother showing you the proof for issue two because the real thing is about to come. So um, issue two took a lot of work, a lot more work than issue one even. And um, But it, it, when getting it in hand is going to be very exciting to finally sort of get to the end of this process. Once I have it in hand, then I do have to fulfill all the stuff for my for my second Kickstarter, but it was really rewarding. Issue two, I also, for the first time, I hired uh, another artist to do one of my variant covers. Uh, I do, as I'll show you in a moment, um, I do a series of variant covers. One of the series of variant covers I do is an homage to um, the old Nancy Drew novels featuring Trixie, my um, female sleuth. Uh, and so I've decided that going forward, um, all of my Trixie uh, variant covers I'm going to have drawn by um, different women comics creators, different independent women comics creators who are sort of working in the same space. So I um, commissioned this uh, artist named Heather Farrington to do a variant cover for issue two, and that was a really interesting learning experience. It was the first time I was working with another artist. I had to learn about sort of contracts and how that all worked but it, it all went great i loved the cover that she that she did for me so even though number issue two was even more difficult than issue one rather than easier just because of certain life events that i've struggled through over the last year um i'm super happy with the results i can't wait to get it so in the next part of the video i'm gonna do the unboxing um, of issue two when it arrives and then I will show you all the different variant covers and all the stuff for both issues one and issue two um, so you can see you know exactly what I'm doing I hope you've enjoyed it so far and let's see what these comics look like all right here's the boxes I got my scissors out and I'm really excited but I'm also very nervous because if something went wrong then uh, it was a lot of money um, and, and almost the whole year's work um, I started working on issue two last June, and here it is May. I'm finally getting it in hand. So 
Um, yeah, I'm very nervous, but I'm also very excited. So let's let's do it. One thing that's interesting is I have no idea what's in any of the boxes. Uh, because inside each box, they're also wrapped in these. So when I open each package, it's going to be a surprise. So what issue is inside? In addition to issue two, I also reprinted issue one with some new second print variant covers. So I've got both issues in here. So I've got a lot of stuff. To, you know, hope that hopefully came out really well. And so this first pack is the second printing of issue one. Uh, which I did with the white variant cover, and I'll show all of these a little bit later, up close. Here's one of the variant covers for issue number two. Again, I'll show these all up close and personal once I have them all unpacked. Looks great. This is the one from my guest artist, Heather Farrington, so she's going to be very excited to see these. Oh, this is exciting. It's the Boy Comics variant. For issue two. Um, I'm really excited to see this one. mentioned earlier in the video that continuing the series boy comics was sort of the ultimate goal um, and uh, so here is issue 121 of boy comics um, and uh, I'm just so excited to get this this is the regular version regular cover for issue 2 so this box should have all of the other variants in it So here's the Boy Comics 120. This is the Boy Comics second print variant cover for issue one. So uh, I previously did uh, a Boy Comics 120 variant for issue one that sold out. So when I did the second print, I created a new variant cover, and I'll, I'll show these all up close when I when I go over um, in detail. So here's a very special variant cover, the Super Avery cover, which is a collaboration with another independent comic creator. I want to tell you all about Super Avery, so when I get into um, my, my run-through of all the covers, I really want to tell you about this because I think you'll find it really cool. Here's the Kickstarter exclusive variant cover for issue 2, um, which is one of the favorite things that I've drawn so far. Yep, it's the other first issue, second print variant cover. I think I think everything's here. Okay, I'm very excited to get these comics in hand. And now that we've done this unboxing, I want to show you up close everything that I got today. But I also wanted to give you a close look at um, all the versions of the first issue that I got originally. I want to show you all the different variant covers for both issue one and two, and just. Uh, not just to show you the finished product, which I'm very excited about, but also I want to just talk about variant covers in general as um, both a business strategy and as a creative outlet. So I've mentioned before, Crime Busters is basically, it's like a, sort of a Scooby-Doo sort of um, teen investigators looking into supernatural mysteries sort of storyline. And it's continuing the continuity from the Golden Age series Boy Comics. Now, I had some decisions that I had to make when I was deciding when to put out my first issue. All along, I wanted to continue the adventures of Chuck Chandler, Crime Buster. Um, but as much as I really wanted to have the next issue of Boy Comics, issue 120, 
Um, I also recognize a couple bit of challenges with that. The big one for me, both on a business sense, but even more importantly, I guess, in a creative sense, because I always put the creative ahead. If you follow the creative vision, I think the business will follow. Um, is that the title Boy Comics isn't really reflective of what I'm doing. Uh, it's limiting. It's limiting your audience. It w the comic originally was designed specifically to uh, was marketed to boys between like seven and 14. That's not what my comic is about, especially since um, I really want to have a strong female co-lead heroine and Trixie Trouble, who I created for that express purpose. So that's why I decided to change the title to Crime Busters. Um, but, and also to start numbering with issue one. So I eventually decided Instead of doing a Boy Comics 120, I was going to do a Crime Busters number one. But this led to a series of other creative decisions that I found personally very fulfilling in terms of my variant covers. So um, I've shown you before, but let me just show you again the regular cover of Crime Busters number one. Um, so here's my original regular cover, Crime Busters number one, with the first issue blurb. My original version to this. I actually still have the original numbering of 121. And what I decided to do was I, I knew all along that I had to have a very um, cover with the Boy Comics logo and the numbering of 120. And once I made that decision, uh, it was obvious that I also wanted to do another variant cover because the Boy Comics 120 cover is going to clearly, you know, be focusing on Chuck Chandler, Crime Buster, the original Boy Comics character. But since I also wanted to highlight Trixie, um, I, it, it occurred to me to do a series of Trixie variant covers that are homaging um, the classic girl detectives. You know, there's a, it's one of the big tropes in the genre of sort of these young adults or, or teen sort of detective novels is the girl sleuth. Nancy Drew, Trixie Belden, who, you know, I'm homage with the name um, Trixie Trouble, and um, all the way up to Veronica Mars. It's like a key staple. So I thought, since I'm going to be doing a variant cover every issue that's focusing on Chuck, I should also do this other series. This turned out to be a great also in terms of um, a business decision because my they target very different audiences. The... People that tend to want to get the boy comics variant covers are comic book collectors, golden age comic collectors, fans of, you know, public domain superheroes. Whereas people see the Trixie variant covers and they're fans of teen detective novels. They're fans of Nancy Drew. They recognize the genre. So here is my original um, boy comics number 120 variant cover. It's an homage to the cover of Captain America Comics number three. Um, the cover that cover was done by the great Alex Schomburg. I had a kind of a brain fart. This is the last thing I did before I rushed this to the publisher, and I accidentally put on the front cover uh, and on the inside, um, crediting this as an homage to Simon and Kirby, the regular artist on Captain America. I knew that it was actually Alex Schomburg. I just had like uh, distress got the better of me. But here's the original cover for Boy Comics number 120. And as I just mentioned, I did the Trixie's Mysteries variant, which is designed to look like a Nancy Drew book cover. The first Nancy Drew book was called The Hidden Staircase. There's a part in this storyline where they find a hidden staircase. So I decided to just go full homage and call it The Secret Staircase and do it like like it's the book one in the first volume in a series of uh, detective novels um, and as a sort of a double or triple homage even. The cover here is an homage to the cover of Detective Comics 395, which is the first Neil Adams issue. It just worked out perfectly where it had the staircase um, and also it just seemed like a, like a perfect nod to the genre to have it be an issue of detective comics that I was homaging. Now, in terms of um, how that's worked out, the regular version uh, of the comic, I ended up getting 100 copies printed and I got 
um, 33 copies, I think, of the uh, Trixie's Mysteries um, variant and uh, 25 copies of the Boy Comics variant. I'm now completely sold out of both of those. Um, I might have... I might have one copy of the original, the Trixie's one. I have to sort of do do some math on that, but I, I basically sold out of both of those, and uh, they do very well for me at conventions. People see the Trixie one in particular, uh, just people recognize it. They they know immediately what it is, and so I had promised that these variant covers would be exclusive, that I wouldn't be reprinting these covers, that. Um, Initially, I thought that was going to be a little bit of a problem, but then I realized, of course, it's actually another opportunity. One thing that I've learned um, that uh, Tyler James stresses in his comics launch uh, stuff about Kickstarter is that the problem is the solution. And so I realized what I could do is actually do a new second print with new variant covers. And so that I can still keep the... the um, the exclusivity of the first print so that those will never be printed again so the people that have them they have their they have that version and, and no one's really going to get a chance unless i release a couple of the personal copies that i have from my own collection but people who still want to get like a set um as complete as you know if someone gets one of the trixie covers they're going to want to get another trixie cover so i did some second print variants this is one of the ones i just unboxed and received this is the first issue of crime busters it's the second print variant cover for the trixie's mysteries book one secret staircase i did a couple things here obviously i reversed the color scheme to um, make it sort of jump out as being um, a second print uh and you know um that's also sort of an homage to the originals because some of them do have the blue on the yellow they this sort of go back and forth so that's what i'm going to do going forward the first prints will have the blue with the yellow the second prints will have the yellow with the blue um this is also an homage to a different classic cover um it's an homage to amazing ghost stories number 15 which was drawn by the great matt baker i did a little bit of a sketchier sort of more abstract style with the artwork on this one as opposed to the other one but uh, but i'm very pleased with the result similarly um here's the second print boy comics number 120 variant for issue one um and this is uh an homage to the cover of boy comics number 10 i made some changes it's got my villain death mask the original had um iron jaw on it um and there's a couple things like uh the the subtle difference between the color of the top of his head and the background is lost a little because when you print the comics they always come out darker than they look on your computer screen a little bit darker i didn't quite compensate enough for that so if i go to a third print of this i'll probably probably fix that up and that's one nice thing about you know these is that with these second prints I'm not making any promises about it being exclusive. So people that have the first print are going to have the first print and that's never going to be reprinted. If I sell out of the second prints, I'll go to a third print and I'll just use the same, same variant covers. Um, but so yeah, I've ordered a 25 of each of these to mainly to bring to shows and also so that like when I do my next Kickstarter, I can offer sets of the boy comic variants for like all three issues or sets of all the Trixie's mysteries. So this is something that's been very creatively fulfilling for me, but it also has worked out from a business standpoint. I'm, I'm happy to say that I've almost completely sold out of the first issue of all the printings. Uh, so I also did a second print of the regular cover. Um, I changed a couple things uh, as you can see. Um, the main difference is, of course, is that it has the white background instead of the black background. I also changed the banner. I gave it a blue background here instead of the red and yellow. And I slightly lightened the green circle. I changed some of the colors on the text down here where it says first issue. And um, I'm really happy with the way this came out. Um, part, uh, part of me thinks it actually looks better with the white background so I'm, I'm really pleased with it you may notice i also removed the price on the first printing it says eight dollars now i've removed that i'm still planning on selling this for eight dollars on kickstarter and it shows 
the one thing that I'm trying to get into a few local comic shops just to build my fan base here in the area and there's a lot of pushback at that price point so by removing this I could theoretically if I decide to bring this to local stores and and they could price it at six dollars or five dollars or something um, it gives a lot more flexibility to me and to the stores to just not have the, the price listed on there at all so those are the the three main um, variants that I'm doing but I'm gonna do actually doing a fourth variant for every issue and that is the Kickstarter exclusive variant cover so here's the Kickstarter exclusive variant cover for issue one and you can see that it's the Crime Busters logo, but I use the original Boy Comics numbering. Again, this was mainly a creative decision. It was just for me personally. Um, I really wanted to continue that numbering. And even though I had the Boy Comics variant, there was a part of me that was like, oh, I should, I'm really old school. I love continuing the numbering, the legacy. It just has a personal meaning to me. So my compromise was to go ahead and make yet another variant cover with the numbering that um, continued from the original series. And what I've done is I've made this, this series is Kickstarter exclusive. So the Crime Busters with the legacy numbering variants, you can only get them if you back Kickstarter. I have them priced at the same price as the regular version. So it's not like you can either get the regular version for $8 or this version will cost you twice as much. I wanted it to be just whichever one you prefer. So this is also $8 on Kickstarter, and it just gives people the choice. Um, the other uh, variants, the Trixie's Mystery Variant and the Boy Comics Variant, I priced those at $13 on Kickstarter. Um, I sometimes drop it to $10 at shows. There's, a lot, there's more resistance to the variant cover premium price there. Um, I'm, but I'm still working that I, I've only done a couple shows. Um, but this is basically just a true variant where it's, an, it's just an alternate version, whichever one you like better. This, as you can see, is an homage to the classic cover of Flash Comics number 93, which was the first issue where Black Canary got her own solo series. And, um, that cover was actually an homage to Detective Comics 39, uh, 38, the first appearance of Robin. So this is like a double homage cover, and you can see here I took some of the text from that first Robin appearance where, and altered a little where it says the sensational character find of 1956, which is when my stories take place, Trixie Trouble. So this is sort of aimed at people that want to get that first Trixie Trouble appearance. Um, when I did the Kickstarter, I made this Kickstarter exclusive. I did have some left over, so I offered them up as a, a potential reward for it when you back issue two. I had a package deal where you could get the Kickstarter exclusive set for both covers, and I ended up selling out of the rest of these. So the only um, first print copy uh, variant for issue one that I still have, I do have about seven or eight copies of the regular cover, but I'm going to be sold out of those basically next time I go to a show. I think that'll be it. I did a fifth variant for issue one, um, and it's the blank cover. Um, I uh, just wanted to have these so that um, I can offer as, again, the Kickstarter rewards to do sketch covers. I priced them at $50. They're very difficult for me to do. I don't do them at conventions. I'm, I'm not confident enough in my art to try and draw these at a show i'll take orders at conventions if people want and then mail them out um, i've only sold a couple of these and, I, and i've done like one as a gift for someone and i have sold one or two of these blank covers to people um, who wanted to get their own art which is great um, but i still have probably uh, 19 or 20 copies of this um, and but that's fine. This is something I expect that you know every once in a while someone will ask for a sketch cover. I want to have a sketch cover available at some point. I want to do um, blank versions with the Boy Comics logo and with the Trixie's Mysteries logo. But though that's down the road since I have so many of these left, I just don't think it makes sense financially for me to do that. So that's issue one. That's sort of the thought process behind the variant covers. And let me show you all the covers that I just unboxed for issue number two. So here's the 
regular cover for issue number two. Um, I'm still learning um, how to draw. One great thing about doing all the homage covers is it really it's taught me a lot, particularly about coloring and lighting. I've mentioned I'm colorblind, and so the way some of the colors change to completely different colors depending on what the lighting is is something that I'm really uh, has really been sort of an eye opener for me when working um, homaging other people's work. In this case, this is probably the best thing I've done so far that was a hundred percent original. Um, I did use some some photo references for the poses and the building. Um, the figure of the ghost bride here looming over the castle is actually me. I took pictures of myself looming over my desk chair and then I used th those photos of myself as the reference um, when I was drawing this. So uh, you know, I'm very excited about this story. It's sort of my take on the classic sort of Scooby-Doo haunted house story. Um, it was also partially inspired by the Haunted Mansion. You may recognize the building here is an homage to the Haunted Mansion because I'm a huge fan of Walt Disney World. Here's the exclusive uh, Kickstarter exclusive legacy number variant cover. Um, I'm a big fan of this. This is Vera Veritas. She is Trixie's roommate. She's one of the supporting characters in the series. And what I'm doing in the backup stories, I'm doing short backup features that are basically solo adventures highlighting a different supporting characters. I really enjoy that when I read it in other people's comics because it really rounds out the cast. You, I don't have space in the main stories to give some of these characters in as much development as I want, but in the backups, I can really do that. So in this issue, Vera gets her own um, backup spotlight solo adventure. I decided to put her on the cover. This is an homage to one of my favorite covers of all time, which is Planet Comics number 31 by Maurice Whitman. I'm very careful whenever I do these that I credit them on the cover. I also credit them on the inside cover. I do sometimes do homages inside the book. If I'm doing a sequence and I'm like, you know, in the first issue I did a sequence where I was like, oh, they're having this fight scene. I really want to do a Gil Kane punch. And that's where Gil Kane had this one thing that he used to do all the time where the character would be punched so hard that he'd basically fly off the page directly at you. So I did, I found this cool Gil Kane punch image and I um, basically did an homage, but I made sure to credit on the inside the book that that panel was based on a Gil Kane drawing. Um, so it's clear that I'm not just swiping. I always try and give credit. In this case, it's um, the artist is Maurice Whitman. I just love the original. It does tie in with Vera's story. In fact, that issue of, of um, Planet Comics appears in Vera's story because she's a comic book fan and this takes place in the 50s when that came out so um this was again the kickstarter exclusive variant it didn't uh i didn't sell quite as many of these as i had hoped since my printer had a minimum print run of 25 um i i'm gonna end up with probably five or six copies left over and uh that's okay because then i'll be able to use them as potential rewards when I do the Kickstarter for issue three. But since they are Kickstarter exclusives, that's the only way that I'm, I'm selling them. I'm not bringing them to shows or anything like that. So here is the Trixie's Mysteries book two variant cover for issue two, the mysterious mansion. And this is, um, I mentioned earlier in the video, I, this is the first time that I brought in another artist. I, I hired, I commissioned an artist by the name of Heather Farrington, who um, uh, does her own comic series that she writes and draws called uh, Juvenile Diversions. And uh, I really liked her art style with this sort of Archie influence that I thought it fit in perfectly with my book since I, my art is also Archie influenced. And she um, did this uh, Scooby-Doo inspired group shot with all the members of the Crime Busters, um, Chuck and Trixie, of course, and here's Vera. And then this is Stu and um, Chuck's pet monkey Squeaks, who's from the original uh, Golden Age series. I, I really love this um, cover and uh, everything was great working with Heather. So I'm really excited to get this, but also excited to show this to her and, and send her this because it, it's just really cool. I'm also really excited to receive, of course, the Boy Comics 121 variant. As I mentioned, this is the the seed of the original idea was to continue the Boy Comics line. So 
Um, I did this again. It's another homage cover. Um, in this case, it's an homage to uh, Simon and Kirby's classic cover for Adventure Comics 74, um, featuring their updated version of Sandman. Um, in this story, I brought back a, another Boy Comics character to guest star named Yankee long ago. And he's a character who has the power where when he dreams, he time travels in his dreams. So since I had that sort of dream aspect that plays into the plot of, of issue two here, I decided it would be appropriate to do an homage with a Sandman cover. This one of my homage covers, this one veers the furthest from the original material. It's got the same layout, but I, I changed a lot, almost all the details. And I'm really happy with that. Um, that's kind of where I want to go with my homage covers going forward is less um, sort of strictly copying the original and just more more using it as a guideline. I'm also going to be bringing in more guest artists to start doing some of these, um, partially because I just love having other artists interpret my stories. It's so fulfilling to see that. Um, there's also, again, a sort of a finance, like a business angle to it because then they can bring in their fans to um, buy copies and then they can potentially become new readers. So it's one, again, it's one of these great instances where the creative and the business decisions um, balance, go hand in hand and it's fulfilling on both angles. So I am looking to do bring in other artists for more of the variant covers in the future. But for now, I'm really excited with how this came out. Um, yeah. And then finally, I will save this for last because it's probably the coolest of the variant covers. I'm going to have some in the description below. I'm going to have information if you want to learn more about Avery. Uh, so this is my super Avery um, variant cover. The interior is the same as, as all the other versions of issue two. Um, but as you can see here, it says the Crime Buster presents Super Avery by Avery Hool. And I've got my, you know, I've got Chuck here and my character Trixie. And in the middle is Avery Hool's superhero, Super Avery. Um, so the story is that um, Avery is a comic book creator. Uh, he writes and draws his own comics called Super Avery 3001. And... Um, Avery also is on the autism spectrum. He has ADHD and, um, yeah, I think that's right. ADD, I forget how that's said. Anyway, he's on the autism spectrum, and um, he he's very inspiring to me. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I had all these insecurities about doing comics, and Avery um, doesn't have any of that. He... Do, he writes and draws the comics because he just loves to write and draw the comics. And he um, was nice enough to agree to um, collaborate with me on this cover. I wanted to use the small platform I have to sort of promote some of the artists that, that do inspire me. Avery, his work can be viewed. Um, they have, he hasn't printed any of his comics in physical form. But his family does have a YouTube channel called the Disney Nerd Herders. And on that channel, um, his father, Charlie, reads through um, the issues. I think they're up through issue nine that they have videos about all of them. So if you want to see uh, Super Avery and you want to and there's also interviews, you know, Avery appears on screen at times. I've done a couple of guest appearances there. One of them, when we were talking about this, Avery came on and asked some questions about Crime Busters. I'll have the links to those videos down below. So again, it's just um, a really, uh, really happy to be able to do this. And it just shows that the, the only thing that you need in order to make comics is to the love to do it. There's really no other barrier preventing you from making comics. That's something that it took me way too long to learn. I wish I had started making comics myself a long time ago. But now that I have started, I certainly have no plans to stop. So thanks so much for watching this video. I know it's very long. I hope you found it interesting. I tried to give as much specific detail as I could. And please, if you have any questions about the process of making comics, whether it's writing or drawing, the tools that I use, the, the printer, the Kickstarter experience, if anything, um, you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them um, as best I can. And um, I'll have some other links below, like to the comics launch stuff that I mentioned with Tyler James 
and to mice, which I'm not sure is going to happen this year because of the coronavirus, but hopefully things will be cleared up enough by October so that they can still put that on. We'll see. Um, but I'll have all the information down in the links below. I've also got a subscribe button you can hit here. Let me know if you want me to do any more videos about making comics. I'm happy to talk about specific aspects of it and show you some of the stuff I do. I've got a couple other videos here, videos about making comics and the Crime Busters. I've also got videos about um, collecting comics and some of the comics that inspire me. So again, thanks so much for joining me and um, I can't wait to see whatever comics you decide to make. So thanks very much.